Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's middle game video I'm going to talk about tactics and combinations. How to spot them, how to improve on them, at them, how to practice tactics. And I hope that after watching this video you are going to be slightly better and at knowing when a combination is about to happen during the game, whether it's your yours or your opponents. We're going to look at uh, some of the key patterns uh, which uh, tactics are based around and at the end of the video we are going to look at three combinations from real games uh, which involve uh, slightly complex examples. So uh, at the start of the video I want to go over the most basics, basic patterns first. Uh, before I start, I would just like to say that there are a couple of things which indicate whether a combination is about to happen in the game. Uh, I'm just going to switch uh, to this last example, I'm not going to go over it now, but just to show you. Uh, during the game, uh, there are indicators of a weak position. For example, an indicator of a weak position is the weakness of your opponent's king. So, when your opponent's king is weak, there is a possibility for a tactic or a combination about to happen. These things are important because most strong players, most grandmasters have develop, developed a sort of uh, intuition for when a tactic is about to happen and weaker players still have to rely on pattern recognition and knowing when there is a possibility for something to happen. So king safety is the first thing. Whenever your opponent's king is unsafe, especially when the pawn structure around it is wrecked or there are missing pawns around it, that means that there is a possibility for a tactic. Secondly, when you have attackers near your opponent's king, then it's highly likely that something uh, is possible. There is a combination which you could do. Thirdly, uh, and very important, uh, when your opponent's pieces are offside, uh, you can often see uh, pieces undeveloped on the queen side, for example. You can have a rook, knight and, and bishop still at the original squares. That will often mean that there is a possibility for a combination because there are no defenders around your opponent's king. There are some other things. Uh, for example, when your opponent's back rank is weak, when the king has no luft, when you have a great piece in the middle of the board, such as this knight controlling many key squares. But basically, there are... Uh, uh, prerequisites for a combination which you can learn how to spot. Before I start with the patterns, I would just like to emphasize that the best thing to do to get better at tactics is to just solve tactical problems and combinations. My advice would be that you take a book, uh, any book with tactics, uh, a newer one would be great because very often old books have uh, errors in them. Take a book take a combination, set it on your board. My advice would be not to do it on your computer because during tournament you are going to be playing over the board and just think. Uh, if you need help uh, with calculation exercises, I have made a video on how to calculate variations. You can watch that. I'm not going to go too much in depth in this video. And uh, yeah, I, I think that that's the most important thing to emphasize. It, once you know the patterns, uh, repetition and practice is key. So let's go over the first example. The first example is a simple fork, but there is another uh, tactical idea behind this fork. Forks happen with knights, of course, and you can fork the king and queen, the queen and rook, uh, pieces, pawns, whatever. A fork is when you attack both pieces uh, with a less valuable piece, most often uh, the knight. So, in this example, you are using the fact that the f-pawn is pinned to the king, so you are using two tactical patterns, the fork and the pin, and the move, of course, is knight to g6. With the move knight to g6, the knight cannot be recaptured, and you are going to win the queen. So this is one pattern uh, which is going to help you find tactics during your own games. If you didn't know the rules of chess, that the pawns uh, which are pinned to the king can't move, then you wouldn't spot this pattern. Obviously, this pattern is very simple, but uh, it's going to happen in your own games quite often. And it's important to combine this pattern with the rest of your tactical ideas. Uh, the second uh, the second pattern is also extremely port important, and that's the discovered attack. In this position, white played knight to f3. And we are going to combine, combine two principles here once again. We are going to combine the discovered attack and the doubled attack. 
So obviously, uh, one more indicator of a combination being present in a game. And by the way, I have listed some of my ideas for indicators in the description below. You can read that. Is when you have a battery of a bishop and a queen, uh, a queen on, or a, and a rook on a file or on a diagonal, looking towards the king. Then often your opponent's king is in great danger. And this, in this example, this battery can help with your idea of a double doubled attack and a discovered attack. It's clear that this knight is undefended, it's only defended by the queen, and the queen and the bishop are attacking it. So if the knight from d4 should move, the knight will be attacked twice. Now where can you move this knight to make sure that white doesn't have time to defend the knight on f3? Combine the ideas of the discovered attack and the doubled attack, and you get the move knight to f6. After this move, white of course resigned. The knight is attacking the queen, the queen is defending the knight, the knight is attacked twice, white's best try is to resign, I guess. I mean, you, you, you don't even ha have a square to exchange the queens, you can't go here and exchange the queens, so basically white is losing a piece. So this idea is very important. Whenever you have a battery in the position, whenever you have a bishop or a queen on a diagonal or a rook on an open file, and there is a piece uh, behind uh, behind that rook, no matter how many pieces are in between, there is a possibility for a discovered attack. And that's why usually if uh, a player puts his rook on a file, and for example the queen is on e7, and there is a knight uh, here, there is a bishop here, there are two pieces in between the, the queen and the rook, strong players are, are still just going to prophylactically move the queen away from the file to make sure that there are no discovered attacks. So whenever there is one of your pieces, especially uh, valuable pieces, on a diagonal or on a file where, where there is a bishop or a rook, you need to be careful about that. So whenever your opponent has a piece, no matter how many pieces in between, and your bishop or queen or a battery ideally are staring at it, look for possibilities for a discovered attack. If you can get a doubled attack, double attack to work, then that's just winning the game. Uh, the next pattern we are going to look at is a pin. Uh, once again, I've set up a fairly simple example. In this position, the material is equal. Uh, white is a pawn down, that is irrelevant. But uh, the main theme is this bishop pinning the rook. Now, it's black to move. If you just take the rook now, uh, then you're going to be an exchange up and you will probably win the game. But whenever you have a pin, remember one principle which Aron Nimtsovich said, the threat is wrong, uh, stronger than the execution. The threat is stronger than, than the execution and that is why you don't take the rook here. You can attack the rook two more times. The best move here is either rook to e8 or rook to b2. Once you play rook to e8 and your opponent is forced to defend, well, there, there's nothing there's nothing in the position. In fact, this might be a better move, uh, rook to b2, because after rook to e8, he can play rook to c2. So let's say rook to b8, attacking the rook once more. Here, here, and white can resign. So this is the power of the pin. Uh, there is one more, more saying, uh, the power of the pinned piece is imaginary. So this is another thing you need to remember. Whenever you're pinning one of your opponent's pieces or he is pinning one of yours, this piece is barren. It's it's completely dead. Imagine that it wasn't on the board. So often if you can pin your opponent's piece, it's as if you took it off the board. You are playing a piece up. The pin is a very important uh, pattern to, to remember. The next one is going to be slightly harder. This is from a real game, uh, Misho Cebalo uh, versus Ferchets Nenad from the Croatian Championship in 1998 and it's a very fun game uh, both of these players are very strong croatian croatian players misho cebalo uh, won the world senior championship a few years back he is now an older grandmaster but still very strong and in this example we are going to be looking at the skewer a skewer is when you can attack two pieces on the same file or on the same diagonal uh, at the same time in this example, black has a better position, of course, and uh, <clears throat> if there weren't for the skewer in the position, he might still be better, but there is one move that's simply winning here. How can you attack one of white's strongest pieces, and there is a minor piece behind it which is going to drop? The move is fairly simple. You play bishop to f8, attacking the queen and the knight. There is no way for white to defend both. He has to move the queen after that the knight is dropping. So this uh, pattern, the skewer, is very important to remember. Uh, in this position, if black continues the, to play normally, I mean, perhaps white can survive. And once again, an indication of a tactic. 
you have loads of your pieces uh, next to your opponent's king. His pieces are kind of offside. I mean, those aren't ideal defenders. The queen is offside too. So most of us would be looking for checks on, on, on g2 for ways of getting the rook into play. Let's say rook to g7, moving the knight, trying to threaten checkmate here. Because obviously if you play rook to g7 and the knight moves, you have checkmate here. So it's really hard for white to defend anyway. But never neglect the whole board. Perhaps in a very tactical position, you're going to have a simple skewer like this winning a piece. And the problem for white here, for gospodin uh, Mr. Cebalo, is that uh, he probably neglected the queen side uh, with all of this happening on the king side. So be aware of tactics of, on all sides of the board. Uh, the next example is deflection. And uh, deflection and removing the defender are two different things. Uh, you deflect a piece from defending a square and you remove the defender from defending a piece. Uh, so, in this position, uh, black is obviously a piece down. And if we voted now, how many of you would have white, how many of you would, would have black here? I think that if there weren't for one single tactical uh, problem for white, white is obviously winning. Give white a move and he is going to win. White is pinning this knight, so obviously he is one move away from completely destroying black a move such as knight to e2 and the knight is dropping. But uh, you should remember the patterns with back rank checkmates. And often when the king is in the corner in fianchetto positions with the pawns on, in this case, h2, g3 and f2, if the king is dragged out to f2, uh, queen h1 check can be devastating. And this is exactly the pattern that was used here. How can you deflect the king from defending the h1 square? Rook takes f1, king takes f1, Queen h1, checkmate. The knight is co conveniently defending the e2 square. Often you are going to have a rook on the e-file or something else. But once again, many people would be devastated in this position. You would think about how do I, uh, how do I save my piece? What do I do in this position? How can I defend? And white is obviously one move from saving the position. I think that the move f3 would be simple, simple enough here. And then rook takes f1 doesn't work. But remember the patterns. Remember that uh, an, at an attack can come quickly and that queen h1 can be devastating. So sacrificing even more materi material brought back vi black victory here. Uh, the next example uh, is removing the defender. And this is a beautiful one. Uh, okay, so tactics. <clears throat> Uh, you have your knight, uh, which is eyeing the f7 square. If you can check on f7, the king is trapped, the king can't go to g7, the knight is restricting the, the king from going to g8. So if you play knight to f7 check, that's actually checkmate, if the rook weren't defending. So how can you remove the defender of the f7 square? What do you do? How can you, how can you remove the rook from the defense? And in this game, a wonderful move was played, queen to d8. It's a queen sacrifice, which just can't be taken. If you take the queen, it's checkmate. It's not that you're winning the rook, it's checkmate. So what can black do in the game? Black played rook to c8, but now uh, removing the, the defender, uh, a fairly simple tactic, queen takes c8. And now once again, uh, if rook takes knight f7 checkmate, if black does nothing, queen takes rook is a threat, and then knight f7 checkmate, and that's it. If you move the knight now, then queen takes rook is with check and uh, queen g7 is checkmate. So let's say knight here, you take here, and that's it. You are dead. So queen to d8, a wonderful move. Uh, removing the defender of the f7 square and after the, the defense of rook to c8, removing the defender once again. So takes, and that's it. Black gave up. So these are some of the very common patterns. Now we are going to talk about uh, tactics a bit more in detail. These examples that we just saw were fairly simple tactical patterns which you can spot during the game often and which most players can uh, foresee, stop uh, and execute effectively. Now we are coming to a slightly more complex part of tactics and that's combinations. Combinations which aren't just one move uh, blunders, your opponent blunders, you play knight fork and you take a piece. Combinations involve calculation and chess is divided 
between strategy and tactics. Okay, strategy is what to do when there is nothing to do, creating plans. If you haven't seen my video on how to create strategic plans, please do. I'm going to link it in the, in the description below as well. And tactics uh, and combinations are reacting to specific traits of a position. Tactics uh, occur when one side has a weaker pawn or peace constellation on the board. And tactics have to be exploited immediately. Uh, in strategic plans, sometimes you have time. Sometimes you can spare a move or two to do something else. In tactics, when the time is right, you have to strike, otherwise the opportunity is gone. Very often tactics are uh, mobile advantages. There are static advantages and mobile advantages. And if you miss your opportunity, then that's going to be it. Uh, this example I wanted to show you uh, because it involves one very important uh, thing in combinations and that's using a quiet move. Most beginner players uh, just see forcing variations and it's easier of course to play a tactic which is check, 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 checkmate. But very often a tactic or a combination is going to evolve, involve a quiet move which is going to uh, give you a victory easily and if you miss that quiet move your sacrifice might have been unsound you might lose the game on, or whatever uh, this game was between uh, Levenfish and Solomon Gotthilf which is a very a very convenient name in German Gotthilf means help God uh, so Gotthilf was on the receiving end of this combination let's talk about prerequisites for a combination first is your opponent's king unsafe yes do you have plenty of attacking pieces next to the king? Definitely. Rooks on f1 and f2, the knight on d5 is a monster octopus knight. The queen on h6 is such a nuisance that black has nothing to do about it. Are your opponent's pieces away from the king? These two pieces aren't really playing. Uh, the knight is defending the g7 square and the f6 square, but it's not really controlling f7 and h7. The queen is a great defender, but you are basically uh, playing three defenders against one, two, three, four attackers. Whenever you have more attackers than your opponent has defenders, usually you can do something. Uh, very often, two extra attackers are going to be plenty, and one with one extra attacker you can manage. So here, uh, we are looking for ways to drag the Black King out. Uh, I wonder if you can spot the move. You can pause the video if you'd like. This is not such an easy uh, combination to find. And once again, I would like to point out that uh, when you see a move, when you see a tactic, when you spot a combination, you need to do two things. The first one is calculate the position correctly. And the second one, see the end position. What do you get for that? If you are sacrificing something, is your opponent going to be checkmated? Is, is he going to survive? See the end position. Know why you are sacrificing, why you are going in for the tactic or the combination. So that's key here. In this position, with all of the things I've mentioned already, uh, I can see uh, that the f7 pawn is weak, that the knight is blocking the other rook from the defense, so immediately queen takes f8 is an idea. But now let's calculate. And always calculate without moving the pieces. Queen takes f8. Obviously, king takes f8. There are no other moves. Uh, rook takes f7. Check. The king has only one square. King g8. After king g8, you can get your knight into play. Knight e7 check. After knight e7, black can sacrifice the material back. And you always have to look for opportunities for your opponent to give back material. If your opponent successfully gives back material and he survives, you are either equal or worse. Perhaps you can be better, but that's if you took a more valuable, valuable piece already. In this case, if queen f8 check, king f8, rook f7 check, uh, king to g8, knight e7, queen e7, uh, rook takes e7, you are going to be an exchange up, and this will be sufficient. So let's calculate further. After knight e7 check, your rook is on f7, your opponent's king is on g8, he only has h8. So after h8, and you go on from here. You need to, uh, when you spot an opportunity, time management is also key. So during the game, look at your clock and decide, okay, I'm going to spend 15 minutes or half an hour. If I don't find the win in that time, then 
I'm not going to play it. Obviously, don't risk if you're not certain that a queen sacrifice wins, don't play the queen sacrifice. And don't do what I do usually, spending 40 minutes for a tactic to, to work and it doesn't work. So let's look at uh, what uh, Grigory Levenfish uh, played here to crush Gotthilf. So queen takes check. King takes. Rook check. We were calculating this. King g8. 97 check was played. Queen takes, as I said, doesn't work. You are an exchange up. So king to h8 is the only move. Now, uh, let's drag the king further out. Rook check. King g7. Rook check. King h6. Knight g8 check, dragging the king further out. King to g5. And this is where I wanted to stop and uh, we come to the point of the exercise. Very often you need to find uh, you need to find quiet moves. There is a simple idea here that h4 is a very strong move, and after that you can get more pieces into play. You can bring your rooks to check your uh, to check your opponent's king here. But there is a problem. After you play h4, your opponent has g4, and sometimes if the g3 pawn falls, then it's not that clear. So in this position, 11, 11 fish with all of this going on, he just sacrificed his queen. He had the nerves to play king to h2. King h2, a remarkable move and the best move in the position, the winning move. Now, after h4, uh, this pawn is defended. And what changed? I mean, what can black do to, to save his position? This move was timely and he had time to do it. Now, in, in this position, Gotthilf played queen takes a2, h4 check, king g4, rook f4 check, and notice the difference uh, if King h2 hadn't been played, then king takes g3, and now uh, black is threatening checkmate, so we have to react. King to h5, and another wonderful move. I mean, there's another way to win. Uh, there's another way to win. You can play rook to f7 here, and after rook d7, it's just winning. Take here, 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 g4, queen takes g4. Black just has to give up all of his pieces away, and this is checkmate. But he found an ever, even better way to win. Uh, obviously, uh, you want to get your king out of the pin. You want to restrict the king from coming here. So another quiet move, king to h3. After king to h3, what can, what can black do? There's nothing to do in this position. He's just threatened with a devastating blow. So g5, g4 check. In this position, uh, black resigned. And I would just like to emphasize the importance of quiet moves once again, especially king to h2. You have sacrificed your queen, you dragged the black king out. If he has an escape square, if he has a hope to survive, just kill the hope if you have time. You need to know whether you have time for a move like this. Okay, uh, our next example uh, is back rank issues. This is a game between uh, Alyokin and Yoner, from in, played in Trinidad, 1939. And, as I said, very often a tactical opportunity is going to arise if your opponent has a weak back rank. So, no Luft here, the king is stuck on h8. If you can check from the back rank and there is nothing to defend it, then that's checkmate. We are going to co combine back rank issues and removing the defender in this, in this example. So now obviously you are all aware of the patterns such as rook to c8 and then rook takes, pawn takes, but in this case the queen is defending as well. So how do you weaken the back rank? In this position Alyokin played marvelously, rook c8, and after rook takes c8, here is the key move. Obviously uh, d takes c8 is checkmate, if the queen weren't defending. Uh, if you combine that uh, with the fact that queen to f8 is checkmate, and queen to e8, queen to d8, whatever is checkmate, then his next move is logical. Queen to e7, removing the defender. Removing the defender in such a nice way, I, I just loved this position. I remember seeing this for the first time, I, I played it on, uh, on my board for five times and I just loved the position. What can black do? There's nothing to do. He has to defend c8, otherwise that's checkmate. He has to defend e8, otherwise that's checkmate. So let's say Queen takes d7 is the best move, just giving up the queen, and this is the way to defend, but you, you are losing the game. So let's say after queen to e7, queen c6. After queen c6, d8 queening, and that's it. It's checkmate. Whatever black does, it's checkmate. The best move is to give up the queen. A wonderful idea, and uh, I would just like to, 
emphasize how important it is to include back rank issues in your attacking ideas. Most often you are going to get combinations and tactical opportunity because your opponent's king doesn't have Luft. And one thing to remember, make Luft in your games. Play h3, h6 if you have the opportunity, if it's with tempo, great. Just, you're going to, uh, you won't have to think about problems like this. Okay, uh, our last example is from the game Bronstein Gligoric, uh, Svetozar Gligoric, one of the best, or the best Yugoslavian grandmaster of all time. Uh, played in Moscow in 1967. Uh, this position is already much better for Bronstein, of course, and he can win an exchange at his leisure. Uh, he is better, he is better. But we are going to look at overworked pieces. Uh, very often during a game, one piece is fulfilling multiple roles, and that is another great indicator of a tactic coming up. If your opponent has a piece that's doing two things, in this case, it's not that easy to spot, and that's why I chose this example. This bishop is defending the g7 square, which is very important, otherwise it's checkmate, but it's also defending the 8th rank. Okay, very often if the bishop moves, white is going to be winning. So what did Bronstein do in this position? <clears throat> First, he took the exchange. Bishop takes d4. Now the best move, believe it or not, is just to retreat the rook. Why? Because the back rank is weak. The back rank is weak. And if you can remove the defender which is overworked, then you're going to be winning. Unfortunately for, for Gligoric, Gligoric took the bishop, and now it's a simple tactic of uh, deflecting the overworked piece. Exploit the fact that the bishop is defending the 8th rank and the 7th rank. Rook g7 check. You have to take. I mean, if you don't take, it's just checkmate. Bishop takes g7. Rook c8 check. And you have just undefended, Gligoric just undefended the back rank. Now king f7, queen h5 check, king e7, queen e8 check, and uh, after king d6, rook c6, king d5, queen d7, Gligoric gave up. Obviously, he can only block with the knight, and then he's getting checkmated. So a wonderful, uh, wonderful example of, in this position, after queen takes d4, of exploiting the uh, overextended, overworked piece. The bishop is doing two things, just remove it from defending the back rank, and that's a win. Okay, uh, these were the examples I wanted to show you. I wanted to go over the main patterns uh, which you can see in tactics. I wanted to give you, I wanted to emphasize the importance of quiet moves. Uh, once again, if you if you start doing tactical exercises, and that's the thing you should do to improve at tactics, uh, improve your calculation. Just try to try to solve problems over the board without moving the pieces. What I do is draw a variation tree, either in my head, which I can do now, or on paper. Uh, you can watch my video on how to calculate variations. Once again, it's it's in the description below. And practice. I mean, all of this, no matter how many times somebody mentions these examples, you're not going to get much better and the, at them unless you solve tactics. If you can't get any chess books, go to LeeChess, go to chess.com, go to... There are multiple problem-solving websites uh, online and solve as many as you can. Uh, thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. I would appreciate any feedback. Uh, Please let me know what you think about the video in the comments below. Once again, I would like to thank everybody for the support and thank you very much for supporting the channel and for the kind comments and the kind words, the kind feedback and the support I've been getting. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for more chess and see you later. Bye-bye.